Since earliest times, men have been moved to great actions by many a noble cause. But few have released the human energies triggered by a grain of gold. For it, they have dared the elements, swept away mountains, scoured the earth. Out of it, men have made a measure of wealth and success, created baubles to flatter human vanity. Because of it, farmers and tradesmen once raced across a continent to places called Hangtown, Dawson, or Angel's Camp. Today, in Brazil's vast Amazon basin, the gold rush has new names, Porto Velho, Itaituba, Serra Pelada. As always, the hunters are men in a hurry, as if fearful that death will rob them of the gold, that you can't take it with you. But as this mummy hand and gold mace show, there are always those who try. Exploring the Amazon, Calypso follows the path of early adventurers. Yet few suspected the river itself often was lined with treasure, held in its shifting sands a fortune in hidden gold. In a guarded government vault, Jean-Michel Cousteau is shown a nugget from one of the new Amazon mining camps, now making Brazil third largest gold-producing nation in the world. Believed a gift of the sun, such nuggets were fashioned into dazzling treasures by Indian artisans centuries before the Christian era. Even in early times, they had learned to pan gold from river sands, smelting and shaping it into common ornaments, or even consecrating kings by clothing them in gold and dust, the fabled El Dorado. Yet for the Indians, their wealth would become a deadly possession, a warrant for extinction. Awed by the riches of unsuspected civilizations, the conquistadores and later Europeans methodically captured, tortured, or massacred Indians to force revelation of places where gold was hidden. Enslaved, they became porters, carried gold for their conquerors from pits they themselves had dug. Later men still climb out of similar pits at the gold fields at Serra Verde. But today, they are slaves only of their own expectations, the lucky strike that will bring sudden riches. On the Tapajos River, a new expedition prepares to explore gold country, this time without galleons and fighting men. Instead, Jacques Cousteau waves good luck to Calypso's long experienced teams and the Brazilian natural scientists who have joined them. Together, they will travel in an array of versatile craft fitted to deal with varied and often unpredictable conditions. In the helicopter, Jean-Michel follows the small, efficient caravan traveling the Trans-Amazonia Highway, which parallels the river. Moving southward, sometimes by air, sometimes by land or water, the explorers will converge on the gold camps south of Itaituba. Watchful of hazards, Hugo Lamprati guides Jacare swiftly upstream. Along the bank of the Tapajos, a scattering of temporary shelters begins to appear. 
then the squatting figures of garimperos, or prospectors, spaced at intervals along the sand bar. But there is one, a loner, tidier than most, who rouses Jean-Michel's curiosity. It is our first meeting with Pasquale. He's not one of the big prospectors with important claims and equipment to process the gold. Like other small-time guy in Peos along the river, his only equipment is the pan in which he endlessly washes the sand. Though he has a wife and children in Itaituba to whom he is devoted, he shares life with his family only through the rainy season when prospecting is impossible. For three to six months at a time, he leads a solitary life in the forest with little more than a hammock, a pan, and utensils in which he prepares his food. Here, over a small fire, Pasquale dries the gold residue from the day's panning. While Raymond Carl and I watch, he shakes the grains into a piece of folded paper, 11 grams, worth about $150, the usual price of a prostitute in the river camps. Now, after the ride home, he breaks camp in hardly a minute. Yet, during three-hour journey upriver, Pasquale still seems trapped in solitude, unused to a world where children play and women wash clothes, not sand. Itaituba has a look of suddenness. Plain, quickly built shops and bars, surrounded by motley homes and shelters. Everywhere, signs announce the town's reason for existence. Everywhere, signs declare, we buy gold. Though many of its 50,000 inhabitants may spend a lifetime here, few think of it as more than a temporary stop. With Pasquale, we go to the buyer with whom he usually deals. From his pocket, he takes the small bag of golden grains, the accumulated earnings of three months in the forest. Then he watches intently as the weights are balanced against the gold. On the amount depends the food, clothing, and perhaps a few presents he can bring his family. At last, given the weight of 27 ounces, Pasquale agrees to the price. Then nearly three million cruzeros, or $8,000, for his long weeks and months from home. For some, the absence is longer. At an orphanage maintained by a German church live nearly 250 children, the casual flotsam of a drifting world. Some are simply abandoned by fathers and even mothers who have journeyed on to other rushes, other destinations, or have died in gold camp accidents. Some are children of prostitutes, casual accidents of the skin trade. Together, our team challenges the children to a soccer game. After all, we are quite fit and have played our share of soccer. But our confidence is quickly shattered. Our players seem to spend much time on the ground. The final score is shameful defeat, 11 to nothing. Licking our wounds, we stagger away. But the children laugh. 
His gold chips weighed and bought, the Garimpero's paper bills at his price. His victory over loneliness and risk in the forest. The victory of the children over abandonment and fear is paid in different currency. They learn to laugh. Driving in the six-wheel truck toward the Marupa mining region south of Itaituba, the Cousteau team learns again that the forest corridors hold many a trap or ambush. For some, flying is quicker. On tiny temporary airstrips hacked from the jungle, small bush planes come and go at frequent intervals. But the risks can be high. Crossing another great tangle of cut trees and brush, Raymond Cole is startled to discover a new kind of settler at Marupa. Here, like early pioneers and homesteaders on the North American frontier, men may earn title to land by clearing it. Presumably, the new owner now will place his fields in cultivation, the growing of crops. But in the gold region, the cutting of the forest is only the necessary prelude to washing away the land itself in the feverish search for riches. Piped up from the sluiceway, thousands of tons of ore-bearing earth are carried over the stepped grates that separate the coarser gravel. But on the blanket at the bottom of the trough appears a yellow sheen, a field traded for a handful of golden dust. Though the earnings vary widely, life in the camp is bleak. Comforted only by cachaça corn liquor, or wives sometimes rented by the week, the garimperos live a kind of suspended life. Working endless hours, they are led by hope, the dream of the big strike, a private El Dorado, the never-never land hidden in human squalor. <laughs> Almost a thousand miles away, near Porto Velho in western Brazil, the Custo helicopter approaches another gold boom settlement. The great flotilla of barges stretched across the Madeira River, trying to vacuum the golden sands from the river bottom itself. Here in Pirau, one of the twin villages on either shore, the Cousteau team, Jean-Michel, Raymond Cole, and Arturo Calvo, briefly join this shifting world quickly build their own shelter of logs and palm frond roof. Everything here is temporary. As the barges move upstream or down, so do the villages. Around them flows an endless stream of new arrivals, on foot or by plane or truck or even taxi.
some young couples with babies seeking a safe place to camp, some footloose veterans of other gold strikes, some poor settlers from the barren south moved by the rumor of sudden riches. Here, few can afford to fail. The prices in restaurants, pharmacies, and food markets are grossly inflated. As the Cousteau team discovers, some barges are used as floating stores, repair shops, or even homes. But most will be used simply as gold recovery platforms, each with a group of two or three divers who work in relays and receive from the owner up to half of the gold found. About to join them, Raymond Cole and Arturo Calvo learn that the risks can be great. Most of the 1,500 divers, or palombares, know little of diving techniques or safeguards. Sweeping the river bottom with suction hoses for three-hour stretches, many emerge coughing blood from air embolisms. With only their air tube as a safety line, the single thread on which their lives depend, some have been trapped by landfalls or submerged trees tumbling in the six-knot current. When barges converge near a rumored bonanza, the river surface sometimes conceals a deadly competition below. Blindly guiding a suction hose in the murky depths, many a diver's air tube has been slashed by the knife of a rival he could not see. Careless of human difficulty, the work of the barges seldom halts for long. Hour after hour, day after day, the endless tons of placer deposit are washed over the trays, a curious mechanical digestive system, drawing in and expelling the river gravel and sand, only to extract a bit of precious gold. In an average month, a barge may gain 11 pounds of gold, and each diver earn the equivalent of $13,000. Tranquil in the sunlight, the river surface is a welcome sight to Raymond Cole as he returns from his dive. A veteran undersea explorer, Cole has ventured into many hazardous waters. Yet even he is left somber by the diving risks of the mining operations in the dark, swift currents below. But there is a wider risk, not only for divers, but for all who pan gold or live on the river. And, as often happens, it wears the face of innocence. In a final effort to separate the gold grains and flakes from the sand, the garimpero scatters a few drops of mercury in the pan and carefully stirs. Bonding easily with many minerals, mercury long has been used in the processing of gold, quickly and effectively trapping the fine yellow particles hidden in the pan. Later, any excess mercury is removed by squeezing the amalgam in a handkerchief. Placing the mercury gold amalgam in a pan, the garimpero now prepares to claim his treasure by burning off the mercury with a blowtorch. Unaware or careless of the dangers carried by the noxious fumes, casual bystanders and playing children, no less than the garimpero, are subjected to the risk of poisoning. The river itself is regularly contaminated by mercury spillage. Estimating that at least 30 tons of mercury have been lost in the past four years, Jean-Michel decides to investigate. Joined by Jacques Constance and Dennis Powers, guest scientists on the Amazon expedition, he prepares to test the river's level of pollution. Flowing through a series of rapids below the barges, the Madeira at last plunges over a falls, a natural barrier and fishing site. Here, hundreds of catfish are caught each day, 
and prepared for sale in Puerto Velho or in the gold camps 25 miles upstream. The team collects water samples and fish freshly caught in the river. After being carefully weighed and the data recorded by Powers and Constant, the fish are quickly frozen and then flown to Johns Hopkins University and laboratories in Monaco for detailed analysis. Initial examination of one fish shows only a high number of parasites. Later tests of samples reveal mercury more than double the ordinary level. Because mercury may accumulate for several years before nervous disorders appear, the samples provide clear warning of a growing threat on the Madeira. Meanwhile, children continue to clean the suspect fish they and their families will eat. Mists lie deep in the Amazon basin, spread by the cool night over countless miles of tropical forest. Now warmed by the sun, the clouds slowly vanish, revealing fragmentary glimpses of life below. Few more strange than Serra Pelada. Jean-Michel remembers. It is easy to believe that these ant-like figures are an apparition part of the drifting world, that like the clouds, they too will vanish. I am on the side of a small mountain, no longer here. Instead, I stand on a cliff gazing down into a vast pit. And what I see seems to belong to some other place, some other time. As the dust rises into the morning glow, perhaps I'm a witness to the building of the pyramids or the punishment of the damned in Dante's Inferno, or perhaps only the filming of a biblical epic by Cecil B. DeMille. But these are not obsessed figures in a dream. The 45,000 men in the pit and on the ladders are real. The landslides are real. Found four years ago, this is the gold wash at Serra Pelada in southeastern Brazil. With pickaxes, men search for the riches in the six square meters of earth their claim allows, descending slowly, foot by foot, through the successive strata. Here, hope is the color of earth that determines if a bag of dust is processed or discarded. Here, happiness is measured by a shovel. Hour after hour, from sunup to late afternoon, a ceaseless traffic moves up and down the walls of the great pit. Bearing 44-pound bags, often supported by a tump line around the forehead, the carriers mount the ladder in monotonous concentration. In their climb, there is many an act of solidarity for those who falter. Without looking, a carrier needs only to stretch up his hand, knowing that someone will grasp it in an instant response. Yet they call the letters, adios mama, goodbye mama. For there are times when none can help, when a ladder sways off balance and collapses, or a falling carrier takes other climbers to the ground. From the upper perimeter of the pit, the loaded carriers form a central column flanked on either side by returning workers who have dropped their loads. Already the protective mist has vanished. Even the air seems a heavy burden. In the 100 degree heat, the fine particles of red dust have formed a new and choking cloud raised by the tramp of thousands of feet. Many marchers wear masks to help them breathe. Each carrier makes 40 to 60 circular journeys each day. 
His trip tallied by the team's counters, both at the pit and at the dump. The carrier empties his sack at a designated drop, then hurries back to the pit. At 40 cents per bag, each trip counts. Each carrier transporting well over a ton in his daily rounds, a total of more than 30,000 tons of earth are being moved each day on the backs of men. A new mountain is rising beside the pit where once it stood. At the bottom of the pit, darkness falls earlier, but often the teams stay later on the job as their quest grows more intense. Here in the muck, sometimes 100 meters or more below the level at which they began working their claim. The owners and their partners often find their richest gold-bearing veins. For the owners, long weeks or months may pass without return while costs accumulate. Lesser partners, sometimes two dozen or more, take lesser risks. Among these are the counters, the bookkeepers on every bag and its destination, and the men with the shovels, for it is their experienced scrutiny which quickly determines whether a bag of earth should be discarded or held for processing. The carriers usually share neither in loss nor profit. But because water seepage at the muddy bottom of the pit makes their burdens more difficult to carry, they often are paid a bonus of 10 cents a bag. Sacks of rich pay dirt often are stored in a compound, watched by team members until the ore can be processed. But since its unruly beginnings, Serra Pelada is largely self-policed, and violence or theft are rare. Guns, alcohol, and all women are strictly banned by common consent. Any serious breach of the rules is punished by immediate exile, a one-way bus ticket out of camp. But like the carrier flashing a gold tooth from a nugget, most are too exhausted to quarrel. In their endless rounds, they pause only briefly for a quick cornmeal cake provided by their employers six times a day. But for some, the pause becomes permanent. Victims of landslides and other accidents, which have crippled many and taken 42 lives since the rush at Serra Pelada began. Watchful of walls of unstable earth created by the digging, the workers themselves take action. Force landslides where collapse seems imminent. For the carriers, every day is payday, averaging the equivalent of $20 per man. 
Confronted by the camp's inflated prices, they need the money to survive from day to day. Standing in line, independent garimperos wait to turn in gold from minor claims outside the main pit. Often they fare little better than the carriers. Waiting patiently while their ore is smelted, they trade stories of good luck and bad, or stand withdrawn, staring at some inner landscape only they can see. At the end, they receive, with mingled satisfaction and disappointment, the result. Better than nothing, less than hoped for. A thin wafer of gold. Now a great man-made scar, Serra Pelada remains one of Earth's most valuable parcels of real estate. Through the sluiceways clustered about the rim of the great pit, an endless flow of ore-bearing gravel has yielded no less than 26 tons of gold worth more than $300 million. Legends tell of great nuggets, of sudden millionaires, even of a cook who, in a few weeks, swept up $20,000 in gold from the dirt floor of his cafe. Few have been more blessed than Joaquim Berrera Bonfim Sobrino, better known simply as Kinko. Part owner of several claims, Kinko labored many barren months before he had paid her. In the past two years, his claims have produced nearly 700 pounds of gold worth over $5 million. Some particles settle on the blanket, some are trapped in the mud hole below the trough this to be processed when the mine is closed. As the coarse gold is dried, Kinko, through the interpreter Silvio, tells Jean-Michel of the group effort. How much, uh, how much time this represent? How much work? What tempo vocês levam fazendo esse trabalho de secagem? Uma semana. Uma semana. One week? Just yeah. this time. One week of work. How many people do? Quantas pessoas para tirar esse ouro em uma semana? 45 homens. 45 people. 45 people to get this gold in one week. One week. And that one, outro é 10 percent. 10 percent. Color. That one is much more yellow. Now Kinko becomes his own carrier. Accompanied by Jean-Michel, he takes his buckets of gold to the government compound. Here, the long process that began in the pit and in the sluiceway continues. Already washed and dried, the gold now is carefully poured onto a plastic sheet. Then, with a magnet, a government worker extracts and discards any remaining iron dust, another step in the removal of the gold from its surrounding waste. The precious metal is then placed in an ore bucket with a resinous compound. As the gold sinks to the bottom, any remaining impurities will be trapped and rise to the top with the resin. As the bucket is consigned to the furnace, Kinko and his associates talk of new plans, new strikes during the 45 minutes or longer required to smelt the gold. Poured into an ingot mold, a slab of white heat in the smelting room, the molten metal glows, the beckoning fire toward which all their search has led them, the holy grail of conquistador and garimpero alike. As it slowly cools, the resin to which all the impurities have now been joined is carefully scraped away.
Now, in a final step to remove the last traces of resin, the heated ingot is plunged into buckets of acid cleanser. Rinsed in cold water, it at last has the color of pure gold. In watchful silence, Kinko stands by as the gold bars are placed on scales to calculate the arithmetic of luck. He knows that the rewards make little distinction between the smart and the stupid. He and his partners simply have been at the right place at the right time. Again, the accountant tallies the price after 25% to the Brazil government. Due Kinko are almost 158 million cruzeiros more than $300,000 in U.S. currency. <laughs> Leaving a small trail of loose cruzeiros, a government cashier brings bales of money from the vault. With Brazil's largest denomination in paper bills, no more than 5,000 cruzeiros, approximately equal to 10 U.S. dollars, payment can be a cumbersome thing. Now converted to paper, nearly as heavy as the gold that was brought, the earnings of a week are again placed in a large plastic sack for transport. As he closes the bag and departs, the usually somber Kinko, for the first and only time, allows himself the shadow of a smile. <laughs> Unarmed and unguarded, Kinko carries a fortune through the street without fear of assault. After the camp's first wild months, Serra Pelada's miners have learned well that in protecting another man's rights, each protects his own. Clearly the bearer of good news, Kinko receives an appropriate welcome from his associates. In white hats and clean shirts, his major partners wait with dignified restraint as once again the cloth is stretched upon the ground and the cartons of money spread upon it. Now in plain sight of all, each member of the team, partner, counter or digger, receives his portion. There are few secrets among them. Each has shared the risks. Each, according to his task or contribution, shares the gain. One partner also contributed a legend known across Brazil. Who found the 36 kilo uh, nugget? One time farmer Vincente Lopez retells the story to Jean Michel. It began, he says, with a dream. In it, he saw his daughter covered in excrement. But as he tried to help, he saw it was gold. In the morning, certain a sign had been given him, he dressed in white clothes. Ignoring the jeers of the garimpeos, he descended into the great pit. At the claim, he waved aside the diggers, then knelt down and thrust his arms into the mud. Instantly, his hands found what he was seeking. Slowly, he pulled out 76 pounds of gold, worth half a million dollars, then the greatest nugget ever found in Brazil.
Today, the Great Nugget has been given a new burial site, the closely guarded government treasury vault at Brasilia. Here, Jean-Michel is shown the prized relic, now designated as a national treasure. Still dark stained as when taken from the earth, it is an object of little beauty, impressive only because of its weight in gold. <laughs> Since its discovery, a larger nugget worth a million dollars has been found. Brighter is a smaller piece that bears a curious resemblance to a human profile. Yet Lopez's historic relic has the force of legend, a promise of good luck and riches waiting to be found. At Serra Pelada, men still pray with their feet. Each march into the pit may bring closer the moment of discovery. For a little while, Jean-Michel joins their journey. In fresh clothes unstained by mud, Followed by the bantering cries of workers watching from the cube-like terraces, he retraces Lopez's steps to the bottom of the pit, to the plot where the great nugget was found. There, through Silvio, he hears Kinko's encouraging word to other prospectors. He's saying that... Uh... It's a very hard work, it's tough, and it took them two years to find gold here. They, they have dig 100 meters from the top to where they are now to find the gold. So his message would be that uh, if you trust in what you're doing, you should keep going, always, because at the end it's worthwhile. From another garimpero, Jean-Michel receives a more rueful reply. Apparently, this man has worked here for a long time. He loves it, but he's lost most of what he has. Ovidio Cardoso de Arencar has worked his plot for two years without result. He has sold his house and his car, mortgaged his future, holds a small percentage of his former claim. He is, by all accounts, a major loser. Yet he is philosophic. In gold hunting, as in other gambles, he says, one should win with class, lose with class. <laughs> He's saying that this will be closed in November, but if everybody continues working hard, they will get some gold. Everybody will get a part. And he knows the stories of people that came here, they worked one, two years, and then gave up. The next guy who, that, who found came the found the gold a few days later. So just keep going. Keep going. Today, the men of Serra Pelada continue a journey that began long before the conquistadors. For centuries, man has been victim of a paradox. He seeks the goal that will free him, yet remains its captive. For history, he has set up shrines and totems to gain the favor of the gods. Not least of his symbols was the gleaming yellow metal that promised the power and trappings of worldly success. Today, it remains the symbols whose changing price can be read in the daily paper. Often, the price is no more than the fluctuating value man has placed upon the ultimate commodity, himself.
When the rains come, Serra Pelada is soon abandoned. Passing northward in Jacare, Raymond Cole finds only a great emptiness that will endure for months to come. Under the darkling sky, the terraces and stepped cubes of the great pit are silent now, the lowest levels hidden under the lake formed by the rains. To travelers in future time, they may seem ruins from some improbable past. But these are not an inverted pyramid built to the glory of some god-king. They are monuments of the endless energies of ordinary men. Amid the debris of the ruined forest lie the scattered shacks, now cheerless and vacant. Only a few garimperos, too poor to leave, still try to scratch gold from the bleak hillside. It is a barren life with few amenities of civilized existence. Here, where hundreds of millions of dollars have been produced, is now offered only the risky sanitation of a public latrine, endemic malaria, and little medical care. Once spurred by common hope, the great outpouring of energy during the work season has subsided. For a little while, life falls to its lowest ebb, a lonely, monosyllabic existence. Even the purchase of the week's grocery supply is reduced to a minimum exchange of human communication. Once the sole occupants of the Amazon basin from the Andes to the Atlantic, Indians today are sometimes hard to find. Enslaved or massacred, swept by alien diseases in the five centuries that followed the Spanish conquest, they tried to hide. At Machu Picchu, crowning a precipice 8,000 feet above the sea, the Incas built a secret sanctuary of fitted stone dwellings and terraced fields undiscovered until early in this century. Today, Jean-Michel Cousteau and companions Richard Murphy and Dominique Soumian find only silence. Two thousand miles eastward across Brazil, Calypso's helicopter reveals other zones of silence. Long lost in the vast two million square mile tropical forest of the Amazon basin, Obscure relics tell of a tribe whose life and death have left no other record. Led by veteran Albert Falco, a team explores the cave and embellished stones. As yet, the stone marker and the hieroglyphs reveal no word from other human beings lost in time. It remains an undecoded signal, a message without a meaning. Among the grazing llamas high on the eastern slope of the Andes, a guide leads Jean-Michel to a cave discovered by a hunter two years earlier. Visible artifacts and geologic changes indicate that the cave has been in use for more than 5,000 years as a tomb, as living quarters, or as a ceremonial site during successive cultural periods. This is a fox. This is a fox. Yeah, this is a fox. See here. This is obsidian. This is a glass, volcanic glass. You think this is what they used to hunt the foxes that we saw yes, earlier? Yes, the foxes and the guanacos and the llamas, maybe. That's interesting. 
Could you tell me what, what we see over there? Look, here, one bird is a toucan. This is live in Amazon. And this is the proof the people, the Altiplano, have connection con Amazon. The toucan, traced by the guide, clearly belongs to an early period. It is rarely seen in this part of Peru today. But as the tourists brought from Iquitos know, some Indians do survive, though sometimes in roles less dignified than history first assigned them. He belongs to one of the native people called Boras, B-O-R-A-S. Just remember to the Bora Bora people who was one of the members living in the Caribbean island. It's a long time ago they came to this place in the jungle and they used to be cannibals a long time ago, but they live like farmers now. They don't eat any more people now. You will be coming to dance together with them anytime you want. Like circus performers in a freak show, the Boras display their tribal customs without great visible enthusiasm. Yet obediently, they join hands in a final romp on the open village green, so that later, the visitors can tell their friends they have danced with a cannibal. The dance leads into a more spirited trading session. Here, Indian items made for the tourists are exchanged for trivial oddities from the outside world. A lipstick and a peanut butter. Huh? No more giving away. A lipstick and a peanut butter. Uh, a lipstick. For this yeah. lipstick, I want a blowgun. Tell her you want that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Its fish often depend on stream-side sources of food, neatly clipping the leaves of low branches near the water. Almost at once, we encounter a giant otter, now becoming increasingly rare. Though fiercely aggressive by reputation, he quickly submerges and leads me on a game of underwater tag. As my partner vanishes, I briefly study a strangely camouflaged knife fish. Then trail a jacare, a small member of the alligator family, until he too escapes. In the forest canopy, a monkey and a blue macaw are only two of the countless sentinels who recall each passing through their shadowy domain. As I explore the outlying jungle beyond our river camp with Tatunka and Dominique Sumian, we encounter one forest guardian who seems to have trouble staying awake, the three-toed sloth, a hypnotic creature whose very appearance can make one drowsy. For thirst, in our journey, Tatunka has an instant remedy. With his machete, he cuts a segment from the Sipo de Agua, a vine which draws moisture from the ground, purifies it, and stores it, a great life-giving vein filled with cold, fresh water. Now, an ominous portent. A cut twig indicates that a party of hostile Yanomamo Indians, long at war against intruders, have returned to their hunting grounds. Nearby, the frame of an Indian camp stands deserted. but another twig was cut only yesterday. Suddenly, the silence is hostile, the shadows filled with phantoms. Tatunka urges immediate departure, tales of five intruders killed in an earlier ambush without parley or warning. Unable to deal with the Indians, our options are few. Though our mission is peaceful, we have disturbed the game on which they depend. At camp, I make a decision. We, uh, we found the presence of a lot of Indians back there who have been around for the last few days. And since we never made contact with them to tell them that we were here to look at animals, I suppose that looking at the display of the equipment that we have and the noise we make and so on. It's probably disturbing, and uh, Tantuka think that uh, there is some danger. We should get out of here within 24 hours. Okay. Southward of the Cousteau seaplane Papagayo, Another party follows the river searching for Matisse, a long isolated Brazilian tribe near the Peruvian border. At last sighting the huts and clearing of a tribal village, team leader Raymond Cole radios his position to Captain Cousteau aboard Calypso in the upper Amazon. A report essential in case of mishap 
in the vast expanse of the forest. Approaching the village, Cole, a long experienced diver and explorer, is uncertain of the welcome that awaits them. But as he disembarks from the canoe, he is quickly reassured. Amid clouds of butterflies, the children run toward him. Beyond them, in curious array, the villagers wait. Superbly skilled in underwater exploration, Cole is less sure-footed on land, particularly when required to perform a balancing act. Slightly puzzled by his clumsiness, his bearers cross the log bridge without concern. Showing their skills, a village male prepares a blowgun dart, first notches the fragile shaft with a piranha tooth so the poison tip will break off in the target, then wraps it with cotton to build air pressure when blown. <laughs> The longer the blowgun, the greater its accuracy. At 60 yards and more, a 12-foot gun is a precise and lethal weapon. One target is the taper, sometimes reaching a weight of 400 pounds. Here, Cole returns with a successful hunting party, carrying a carcass which easily will provide food for the entire village. Among the Matisse, Everything is shared and nothing is wasted. Distributing part of his quarry to each village family, the hunter at the end sometimes finds himself empty-handed. Like taper, monkeys, and other game, fish is a staple item in a diet that usually is varied and plentiful. Comfortable with the world into which they were born, the Matisse have placed their signature on the ordinary objects of daily life have invented or learned to make fine earthenware vessels to store their food. They too make art out of their hopes and fears, turning even their faces into masks of make-believe. Yet the Matisse are in crisis. Through an official of FUNAI, the Brazilian Department for Indian Affairs and two other interpreters, Cole discovers that most Matisse males are off fighting a neighboring tribe and that the chief is now a woman. Amid the forest where once her people drew their existence day by day, the tribe is steadily declining. Once there were many Matisse. Now their total number is fewer than 200. The men are killed in the fighting, says the chief. The tribe has been stricken by diseases they had never known before. The lung infections for which they have no immunity or defense. Once one painted designs and patterns on the face, inserted bones or wood in cheeks and chin and nostrils, and the magic protected you. Now the magic is not enough. Her people are dying. That is why the Funai representatives have come. Unable to find all the separate smaller tribal units, they have asked them to assemble in one place, in this village, so they can help fight the sickness which is killing the people. Now, from the Funai medical worker, each person, child or adult, must take the antibiotic pills to help the people get well. For the villagers, it is a new kind of magic. White little round objects which one swallows with a gulp of water in a kind of ritual. The foreigner brought the disease, now he brings the cure. It is a strange kind of game, and the cure seems to help. But just to be safe, they still wear bones in their cheeks and try to be like the jaguar. The jaguar usually does not die from chest diseases. Mm -hmm. 
Sometimes there are those who become exiles from their own species. On the Mano River east of Cusco, Peru, team photographer Ayrton Camargo seeks to visit three women first found five years ago, naked nomads, ignorant of weapons or fire, eating raw turtles, and speaking a language no one can identify. As he crosses to join the women, who only recently reappeared, he will find them changed. Forest rangers have given them clothing and bow and arrow, taught them to build a fire, yet they remain strangers on Earth. Perhaps, as some officials surmise, the last members of a tribe that no longer exists. As a token of good intentions, Camargo brings a blanket as a gift. He tries to explain its function, to be used as protection against the cold. But the women cannot reply. They simply try to imitate. Hidden from the world, the women have lost the vocabulary by which they can express themselves in word or gesture recognizable to others. Sometimes an action seems curiously inappropriate a gesture of joy becomes a gesture of refusal. Fala, sai na neta. Oui. Oui. No. No. Oui. No. No. Oui. Yet to impress the guests, they try to display their recently acquired knowledge. One brings a smoldering fire into flame. Another shoots an arrow at a monkey and misses. In the sound of the approaching seaplane, the women become lonely figures from a primordial past. Outside the ordinary lexicon of human communication, perhaps the only three of their kind remaining on Earth, they have become prisoners of each other, castaways in time. Now they clutch the sound engineer's arm, murmur incantations. Ah, 
They try to wave off this approaching apparition, erase the incomprehensible, flee across the centuries to the more familiar world locked in their minds. But the apparition does not recede. It comes. It is there. Since the earliest Indians, the Amazon and its 16,000 tributaries have served as pathways for canoe and raft. Now on the Shingu River in the amphibious Jacare, Raymond Cole approaches the village of the Tucumai tribe in southeastern Brazil. On the bank waits a silent assembly. The naked women and children are a familiar appearance in the remote regions of the rainforest. But the warriors, armed with rifles and shotguns, seem a formidable welcoming committee, providing, as always, a moment of uncertainty and tension. Among the Tsukamai, the silent blowgun or bow and arrow are their favorite hunting instruments. But against uninvited intruders on their lands, the gun is now the weapon of choice. Easily identified, the frowning chief has the biggest mouth. But if there is hostility, curiosity overcomes it, as warriors remark that Calypso too wears no clothes. <laughs> At the village, as a gesture of peace and goodwill, Cole and the Tsukamai chief exchange headdress, a Cousteau red beret for a feathered bonnet. Though his enlarged lip impedes talking, eating, or whistling, the chief can join in a turtle dance whose origins are lost in the distant past. Traces of ancient ditches and earthworks suggest Indian presence in the region 10,000 years ago. Yet in little more than a generation, the tribe has been wrenched farther from its cultural identity than in all the hundred centuries before. Today, they are learning to live like the settlers at the Mestizos. Warriors have become farmers. Driving tractors, many have exchanged headdress and breechcloth for coveralls, the blowgun for a hoe. They no longer live from one hunt to the next, but from harvest to harvest. In fields cleared from the surrounding forest, the Indians now hoe away weeds and dig holes to plant their corn, their patakat, or beans and other crops. Yet the worker with the cigarette still wears a ballpoint pen as ornament in his pierced ear. And the man in the t-shirt still hears the murmur of ancient myths. The dropped seed can be covered by the hoe. It is harder to bury the men they were. <laughs> Across the continent in southern Peru, Jean-Michel also threads the river's maze, trying to reach another troubled tribe. Carrying other casual voyagers aboard the Piraruku, the Cousteau team's large rubber raft, he moves downstream, searching for the Ashaninkas, one of the Machigenga tribes, also trapped in the collision of two worlds, the old and the new. Following an occasional practice since earliest tribal memory and a custom widely shared since ancient times in many parts of the world, the Ashaninkas are poisoning the stream to catch fish. Treading on the crushed root of the barbasco plant, 
The milky poison drifts and spreads with the river's current, stunning the fish. As filmed by Jean-Michel and Sumian, the drugged fish rise slowly to the surface and are there speared or shot with bow and arrow by the villagers waiting in the stream and along the banks. Smaller fish are killed quickly by biting the neck. Though poisoned, they carry little threat for human consumption. At the temporary dam constructed of logs and leaves and stone, Jean-Michel records the harvest of fish quickly gathering in the trap. While some women clean the fish, others take advantage of the brief period of low water below the dam. There they search under the exposed rocks for the crawling Helgramites, a prized delicacy among the Indians and a valuable source of protein. Yet the Indians use poison seldom, not daring to destroy a food resource by which they survive. Gods sometimes are more expendable. Though fiercely protective of Indian rights, missionary Father Gagnon has dismissed the old tribal deities, teaches the tribe to serve a new Christian god, wear clothes, sing new chants. Introducing his guests to the chief, Father Gagnon tells of Indian suspicions, for they are losing not only gods, but land. Over there and don't look at the house. Just look anywhere except at the, white, uh, the house or the people. The Nadine, okay. He may act a bit angry, but uh, that is just, uh, I mean, he, they really don't miss the, the way of greeting. Coming. And he'll be curious why. Uh, Avida? Avi? Agapi hat. Pate que pa manta mi viejo. Amigos. Kamesta. Bien a conocer para de su casa. Kamesta. 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 Nega, no quiero. Sara. Why is he looking in your bag? It's a sign uh, of confidence and probably disconfidence. I give him plenty of liberty to say I have nothing to harm you. And he takes the liberty to let me know that uh, anything I have, he's allowed to look over. I mean, his property. And now he's going back. Now he's going back. Now the others will come. Oh. So he's not invited you? He's not invited me. He has to speak with his people. And I know him very well, but that's his custom. Even if I'd be his... Uh, his father, he would still have a, an immense respect for uh, the property. Is it because we came with you? Uh, no, no, it would be the same green if I came along. Now I'm with you, they don't know who you are. So he, what he asked me, he said, why did they come here? They come away, they come here to take away my land. And I told him, no, you came as friends. And you, you want to see him, you want to say hello to him, but you don't bring him any harm whatsoever. Yeah. Mm. Everybody's going to look on your bag? All the men. All of the men. The women, no, just the men. <laughs> Nearby, a supply of Masato, the tribal alcoholic drink, is being prepared. From the manioc plant, out of which tapioca also is made, the root is first boiled with sweet potatoes. The pulpy mixture is then chewed by the women and children and spit into a trough to hasten fermentation while stored in a large gourd. Now in their first formal encounter with the chief, Sumian and Jean-Michel are privileged to sample the brew according to prevailing custom. 
passed from hand to hand and mouth to mouth until empty, the bowl soon is refilled and the round continued. <laughs> Meanwhile, to the visitors, Father Gagnon describes the problems faced by the Ashaninkas with the encroaching settlers. Father, you were telling me earlier that uh, they're afraid that we're coming to take their land? Yes. Why, why you probably asked me why you came now. Now they'll start a discussion, you know, what is your business here? And uh, because these people have been uh, terribly abused now, but in the last two years we've had over 5,000 uh, settlers coming in here, uh, taking over not only the land, even some of their property, yeah. and abusing of their, uh, like, corn, just taking the whole thing over. Do they have a land title? No, they don't. They're in the process of getting a land title. The law is uh, very favorable for the natives, yes. but nobody fulfills the law, and there's nobody that makes this law be fulfilled. Theoretically, the natives are defended, and the government from day to day is uh, fomenting invasion of the settlers because they want to develop this region. So they're delaying the uh, fulfillment of the law in favor of the settlers. Obviously, the native, in order to survive, needs an immense territory, I mean, thousands of acres. But absolutely nothing is being done for this. Just to simply come in, take no land away, so they have no defense. And that is very, very serious. It'll be a very short time if some measures are not taken. I mean, they'll just be extinguished. For Chief Kokush of the Hivaro Achiwaras, the future approaches not as a promise, but as a threat. Leader of a one-time tribe of head shrinkers near the Peru-Ecuador frontier, he knows that change must come. Now plants trees so his youngest son's children also will have wood to build canoes. Yet, once safe in the jungle, his people are under siege by outside forces, to whom a blowgun is a tourist curio. Quickly, they are becoming strangers in the world they inherited. Once the Hivaros, like other tribes, trusted the cures that jungle provides. Today, they are increasingly dependent upon the white man's medicines. Suffering infections of the eye and leg, Kukush's grandson receives first aid from the Cousteau team. Later, with his anxious mother, he will be flown in the Papagayo to Iquitos for intensive treatment and recovery. But the children stricken by white man's diseases are often less fortunate. Even ailments such as measles or flu are deadly among the Indians, who still have not developed immunities, as have the whites through long exposure. <laughs> Distrusting the foreigners' cures, fearful parents sometimes turn to an older remedy. They go to the mestizo medicine man, a charlatan who practices his spurious magic farther along the river. Watched by Dominique Soumian and the baby's father, the medicine man has a ready diagnosis and cure. <laughs> Driving out the evil spirits with cigarette smoke, he reminds the parents that a few days earlier, villagers working with the Cousteau team cut down one of the sacred high trees used as guideposts through the jungle. Now in punishment, says the medicine man, the baby is dying. Indeed, despite moments of seeming improvement, the child does die in following days. There are a few ominous mutterings in the village, but Kukush, ordinarily tolerant of shamans, quickly puts down any danger of vengeance. 
As the villagers sell wild boar's hides or chickens to the river trader on his regular visit, it sometimes seems to Kukush that in all the Hivaros traffic with the outside world, the tribe is the loser. There seems to be some ironclad arithmetic that always favors the government, the encroaching settlers, or the wily mestizo merchants. <laughs> <laughs> Having paid a tiny fraction of the price he will demand in Iquitos, the trader stows the goods aboard his boat. There he waits, knowing that the villagers will soon arrive with their meager earnings. <laughs> Quickly, the money he paid will be returned to him for a little cloth, a candle, a bit of sugar, this time at vastly inflated prices. Returning from a journey downriver, Kukush's oldest son, Walter, brings word of a troubling encounter with the soldiers at a military outpost. In an angry exchange with Walter, who one day will succeed his father as chief, the soldiers threaten to come and cut Kukush's hair to conform with government regulations. <laughs> The depth of the affront is explained to Jean-Michel by anthropologist Luis Uriarte, who has been studying Hivaro Achuara culture. Well, see, but the, the problem is they are coming out from Andoa. Uh, they want to sell their chickens because they want to get rid of uh, this exploitation by the merchants. But they had, there's a new military outpost down the river, right at the mouth of the Wasaga River in the Pastaza. So when they were trying to go by, they have to control there at the military outpost. So they were giving a very hard time because they have no personal documents. As a nativo, they say, as a Chuara, they don't have personal documents. They are not human beings. And he was giving a hard time. Not only that, he's threatening him to cut his hair. Chobon, that's a very bad insult because, you know, for a Nachuara to cut his hair would be like a really castrating, to be very blunt about it. I understand why they are so upset. Oh, so he, he said, you know, I'm an Achuara. That's the way we, my parents, my grandparents always were. And therefore, if he wants to come here and cut my hair, I really gonna shoot the, the guy, or I will cut his hair. <laughs> but a boatload of soldiers failed to make good on their threat. Perhaps remembering the legendary ferocity of tribes never defeated by the conquistadores, they pass in silence. Yet the Hivaro children must sing the national anthem of a country which still does not recognize their full rights as citizens or give them the papers of identification provided other citizens. They must pledge allegiance to the flag of a nation which in many ways denies they exist. Still lacking citizenship papers, the Hivaros thus far have been denied title to the very lands they have occupied since earliest history. The reason for the delays, Kukush believes, lies in the oil deposits discovered on Indian hunting grounds and in the fear that tribal claims might jeopardize control and profits for the developers. Now 100,000 barrels a day are pumped through the pipeline over the Andes 
to storage tanks on the Pacific coast. Again, the chief tells Jean-Michel the Indians gain nothing. Instead, the smell of oil and the frequent flights of company helicopters have driven away much of the game on which the tribe subsisted. As capital of Peru, Lima has witnessed the arrival of many heads of state, but few have come so far as the passenger who steps from the plane after the first flight of his life. Arranged by Jean-Michel, Kukush has come to discuss his problems with the president of Peru as one chief to another. it is a journey into another world, another dimension. For the first time, he enters the clamor of a great city, rides in an automobile, passes through streets of stone. For the first time, he will see stairways and elevators, fans that turn without wind, hear on loudspeakers the voices of persons who are not there. At the presidential palace, Kukush will find a friendly ear. Himself once an exile from Peru, Fernando Balaunde Terry is not unaware of the problems of the political outcast. But now center of many contending interests, he knows the limitations of political power as he welcomes his barefoot guest. Recognize the rights of the native population all over the country. Uh, I recently went to Rioja and personally uh, talked to the cacique there, mm. and they were quite satisfied, not only because of their rights that were uh, recognized, but because of the presence of public education. Uh, yeah, and then I've been in Puerto Bermudez with the Campa Indians, where we have handed uh, quite a few hundred titles of property. Mm -hmm. Now Kukush speaks. He tells the president his people know they must change, but many of their customs and their land they want to keep. Their land is beautiful. Their ancestors have always lived there. The government has no right to send people to destroy the jungle. That land belongs to the Indians. Uh, there is a certain conflict of people coming in, but they are always bringing uh, other things. Uh, naturally, when they become uh, incorporated into modern life, they have access to education, and also they are in a position to sell their products. Yes. Uh, isolation is not a good thing permanently. Uh, my experience in trips in the jungle uh, were that Life expectation was very short. There is much talk in this new Many world, says Kukush, but few answers. The words fly away like the birds, leaving an emptiness. Only the pipeline is real. Through it flows not just oil, but the life of his people. Each religion has its holy places. For the Indians of the upper Amazon, the peaks are shrines. In a high valley near Cusco, more than 10,000 Indians from 200 scattered tribes each spring make a pilgrimage of hope, the great festival of Coyuriti. Though it bears symbols of Christian ritual, it also carries fears that were old before Jesus was born, fears of the chaos of change, of the day the sun vanquished the moon. Here amid the peaks, families hide messages in rocky piles, letters to the future. Here couples arrange stones, 
to describe the home and animals they hope for. Here they pray to whatever God may answer, for they have learned that even gods may change. But only the Ukukus, or bears, may climb to the glacier to cut the sacred ice. Creatures of myth, able to survive extremes of change, they have become priestly protectors. It is they who plant the crucifix in the ice and are ritually whipped for the sins of their villages. Then, cleansed, they carry the ice to the waiting people. In their errand, Jean-Michel finds both reassurance and warning. Once master of the forest, the Indian today is victim, exiled from his world by forces he can hardly comprehend. Yet we too are entrapped in illusions of mastery, ignore at our pill the hastening disintegration of the vast community of nature on which our lives depend. The future, it is said, is often mirrored in the present. In the anguish of the Indians, we may foresee our own. Yet, this joyous invasion of the streets of Cusco holds an ancient promise of renewal. The sharing of the ice becomes a communion among a great family in which no man is a stranger. We affirm that each is part of an inseparable whole. For as the Indians know, the ice is more than communion, it is life. Once, I organized a small team of friends to help me explore the undersea world. We found there and we continue to find extraordinary creatures and communities that deeply inspire us, and perhaps you too. But the human abuses that have changed the air and the land are also altering the sea upon which all life depends. What could our small team do? We created the Crystal Society, made up of people everywhere, who add their voices to ours in calling for global changes. Please join me in this vital crusade. To join the Cousteau Society, call 1-800-257-1234. For your $20 membership fee, you'll receive the latest expedition news in bi-monthly issues of the Calypso Log. Join today and get a crew t-shirt. Call 1-800-257-1234 today. Please join me in the Cousteau Society.